So, subject every knee will bow. The return of Christ on this first day, first Sunday of Advent. And bowing the knee is uh, topical. It's uh, been on the football fields for some time and in the World Cup if you're following that. But um, if you're not a football supporter, uh, sigh of relief. I'm not going to mention football again, even though I do like football. Just to let you know what my thesis is, my argument is from these two passages is this. That bowing the knee, how do we do that? How is it possible? Obviously we should do it because God is the only God. But how do we do it? Well, we can bow the knee by growing joyfully in Jesus in the light of his return. So that's my little idea to share with you uh, this morning. When we come to the church, we used to, as Anglicans, bow the knee, literally, in church. That's what pews are designed for, for getting down on your knees. John Stott lamented its passing. He said it was being replaced by the holy crouch. And I think he's got a point. Um, a lady called Courtney Whiting wrote, Kneeling is an attitude of heart as much as the action of the knees. So a few questions. I like to interrogate a sort of subject or a passage. Uh, when will every knee bow according to the Bible? Well, it'll happen at the return of Christ. The Greek word for that was parousia. I mentioned that um, Gloria and myself men uh, met in uh, Lancaster. I was a schools worker and uh, got to know each other. I proposed, I shared that proposal, bending the knee, well, almost bending the knee. And um, uh, we spent, uh, what was it, 84, a couple of years before I went off to Oak Hill, where I trained for the uh, Anglican ministry, and now we've come back. And that, that, the Greek word parousia is presence after absence. It's a very common word, but it's used in the Bible here to speak of Jesus who was present in his first advent, his first coming, but then returns. What does Isaiah 45? You might like to open your Bible at uh, that passage again, if you've uh, got one with you. Um, what does it tell us about bowing the knee to God? Well, because of our sin and rebellion, we don't bow the knee in a natural sense. There needs to be a supernatural change in us to bow the knee in terms of our hearts to God. But that repetition that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, there is no God apart from me, uh, happens uh, four times. If you just turn over the page to chapter 45, verse 5, I am the Lord, there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. And there, then there are three other occasions when it's mentioned. Uh, as a young Christian, I've been a Christian for over 50 years now, I was taught, whenever there's repetition in the Bible, take note. If God repeats something twice, it's important. Well, surely, if God repeats it four times in this short passage, then it's really, really important. So, because of our sin and rebellion, we don't bow the knee to God in a natural sense. We bow the knee to, in this context of this uh, book, uh, idols. Um, that cannot save us. And that's one of the big points made in Isaiah. These uh, idols are futile, and yet we worship them, we bow down to them. And those who turn from God, from idols to God, though, will be saved. God has a redemption plan in the Lord Jesus Christ. There was creation, there was fall into sin, but then there's redemption, and then there's renewal, regeneration and the return of Christ, which we're thinking of this morning. What of those who don't bend the knee in their hearts to, to God? They face God's judgment. What does uh, Philippians chapter two tell us about this question of bowing the knee? Well, Paul changes the quotation. This is what I particularly noticed uh, rereading this time. From God the Father to God the Son. I remember being a, a young student and being newly converted and being faced with questions like, well, Jesus never said he was God. 
this is, uh, of course he did, uh, before Abraham was I am. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. But this would be a good answer to take somebody to Isaiah 45, where it's speaking of God and he is no other uh, God himself. And then getting to Philippians 2 and seeing that Paul changes it to at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, uh, declaring that he is Jesus is the Son of God who saves us by his self-emptying and death on the cross that we read in that passage in uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2. He knelt to wash the disciples' feet. He bent the knee. He went to the cross. He bent the knee to the Father's will in going to the cross. And God has exalted him. God the Father to the highest place at his right hand. There's a striking contrast between the first advent of Jesus and the second advent. First advent born in a stable, in obscurity and humility, uh, in Bethlehem, taking the form of a servant, even though he was in very nature God. And then Jesus in his second advent, already exalted at the right hand of God, returns in victory over his enemies and for his people. It's a great truth, friends, to warm our hearts and to encourage us in this challenging life that we live. What does 21st century British culture tell us about bowing the knee to God? Well, in the last 50 years, I've been a Christian 50 years, please don't blame me for all this, Um, but we all, all have a a part to play, don't we? There's been a wholesale, along with the whole of Western culture, rejection of our Christian heritage. Uh, And yet Christianity is in the air we breathe. Uh, You can't really get away away from it. It's a good thing to talk to agnostics about, incidentally. Um, There's been this rise and triumph of the modern self. Uh, Instead of worshiping idols of wood, and uh, gold and silver were more sophisticated these days. We worship ourselves. And Isaiah 45, as we've seen, tells us that God is God and there is no other. I remember as a young Christian on a camp over in Anglesey where I went for the first six years I was a Christian uh, boys camp. And we had a, um, uh, various competitions. I remember this one where we had two teams and we built two sandcastles and uh, at the end of building the sandcastle as the tide was coming in uh, you had to put a sort of pole in it and it was the last pole to fall uh, was the winning team and I remember this instinct this urge within me to stand on the sandcastle winning sandcastle and tell people about Jesus (laughs) I never did it I regret that but I had that sense I wanted to share what uh, God had done in my life. But in the, in the culture of today, there is this rejection of the transcendent. Um, embracing the teachings of thinkers like Rousseau, the psychological self, Freud, the sexual self, uh, Marx, the political self. Men and women have turned away to idols, to themselves, and worshipped themselves rather than God. In Romans chapter 1, you see this progression. God has uh, shown his invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, being understood from what he has made. Again, I think it was about age 15, uh, often done lots of walks and things in the Lake District, and I was uh, hitchhiking and and staying at various uh, places. Uh, One night, I was sat on a hill on the way to where I was going to stay overnight and the sky was just so clear and I saw all the stars and I I said in my heart there must be a God who made this so God has shown his invisible qualities his eternal power divine nature being understood by what he has made but God man has turned away and sunk into depravity of mind and action and as a consequence God's wrath is coming this will happen at the return of Jesus, but few in Britain seem at all concerned about this truth. God's wrath is coming at the second coming of Christ, but few people 
uh, are interested, it appears, in Britain. Great challenge to us for evangelism, isn't it? To reach out to our neighbours, our friends, our workmates, and so on, and share the good news of Jesus. But there, is, there appears to be little interest, in fact, hostility, growing hostility, because the truth about God has been suppressed. And now, being a Christian who holds uh, to the doctrine of the Bible is held to be a negative thing. It's held up in scorn and it's held up as something immoral even. Since such a view um, involves the suppression of the authentic self. And so we need to express ourselves and be who we are. And this comes out in the feelings and expressions of uh, feelings and emotions. So the way to personal happiness is to throw off all these restrictions, antiquated, restrictive, and be who you are. And in, in fact, uh, just decide who you are and make it up, as it were, from scratch. Well, friends, the good news is that Jesus has come and we can be changed and we can be saved. Uh, on, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, there's that great sermon when 3,000 people were converted in one go. And that would be wonderful to see that. Um, 3,000 people. And there's that wonderful question, which if you're not a Christian this morning, I want to address to you. As Peter preached about Jesus, the promised Messiah, uh, there was this question. He referred to them as brothers. And the question was, brothers, what should we do? And he says, repent, be baptized in the name, interesting link to uh, Philippians 2, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So if you're not yet a Christian, can I encourage you to do that today, to bend the knee to Jesus and to repent and believe in him for forgiveness of sins. If you are a Christian, and I'm uh, fairly confident, well, I am confident there are a number of Christians here. What about you? Uh, well, knowing the times as Christians, I think, is really, really important. I'm reading a book by Martin Lloyd Jones on that series of talks that he gave, and he said this There is nothing which shows our spiritual condition more clearly than our ability to comprehend the signs of the times. And there's something of that in the Old Testament, isn't there? Um, 1 Chronicles 12.32. The men of Issachar, uh, who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. So as Christians, we should know, we should be thinking, we should be uh, obviously praying, but we should uh, understand spiritually what's going on. Well, a great book, uh, again, uh, sounds like my re retirement from being a vicar. All I do is read books or write them. Uh, a great book uh, by Carl R. Truman, um, which is about this subject of the triumph of the human self. Uh, he published it in 2020, and it's been uh, quite a successful book. And he says, first of all, we're complicit as Christians in the fact of not bowing our knee to God, instead bowing our knee to self very often in our lives and he offers some advice and it just so happens that uh, the three things uh, he speaks about in application the end of the book uh, could well have come from Philippians chapter 2 so I want to take us to Philippians 2 if you've got that in front of you as we look at uh, being Christians who are aware and understanding what's going on um, Carl Truman says, the church, first of all, should understand what's going on and how bleak the situation is for the Western church. And if you read the statistics uh, that come out, it is bleak. Um, however, we shouldn't get the impression that Carl Truman, certainly not Philippians or the Bible, uh, is um, sort of put off by that, despondent. No, Philippians... It's a great theme of joy, isn't it? Joy on the inside, irrespective of what's happening on the outside. So this wholesale re rejection of Christian heritage and the rise and triumph of the human self, 
Instead of worshipping idols of wood and gold, we worship ourselves. And we've seen Isaiah 45, that God is God and there is no other. And this rejection of the transcendent uh, by many people. What does he say? He says the church should understand what's going on. So look at Philippians 2 verses 1 to 5. This lovely description of who we are in Christ. We are united with Christ. We have fellowship with the Spirit. And we have fellowship with one another. Aren't they glorious truths that we uh, remind ourselves of as we come into church? And what are we to be like? Well, we are to be... uh, like-minded with Christ, verse 5. So your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So facing these great cultural pressures uh, which the the church at Philippi were facing, they were caught in that wedge between the culture that was hostile to Christianity and uh, being Christ-minded. There was that clash. What does Paul say they should do? Well, he says at the beginning of Philippians, uh, his prayer, this is my prayer that your love, verse 9, may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Notice that word insight. So that you may be able to discern. Notice that word discern. What is best and, uh, and that we may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. That emphasis right through the New Testament But here, right at the beginning of Philippians, on the return of Christ. So how do we bow the knee to Jesus in the context of today's culture? Well, my answer is to joyfully, uh, joyfully uh, be growing in Christ, in Christian maturity, in the light of Christ's return. Martin Luther said, I try to live as if Christ died yesterday, rose today, and is coming tomorrow. That's a great way to live, isn't it? It's very challenging, but a very helpful uh, thought uh, to have. I mentioned that Philippians is very hopeful. Let me give you a very quick uh, thing, uh, just to persuade you, if if you're not already persuaded. There are numerous uh, references uh, to take the theme, for example, which I suggest is in verse... um, 25, convinced of this, I know I will remain, will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. It's about progressing as a Christian, growing in Christ. And it's about joy, progress and joy. And uh, just again, chapter 1, verse 18, um, where Paul is joyful that Christ is preached, even though there's all this opposition going on. Chapter 1, verse 25 mentions joy. Chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, Verse 29 of chapter 2. Chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. And uh, probably the most familiar to us, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Um, Which when you're going through suffering, as my wife and I are at the moment, is particularly challenging. I've been saying to people that I felt the weakest as a human being, but the strongest I've ever felt as a Christian. Because in weakness, God clothes us with his strength. So the first thing we need to do, friends, as we face this challenging situation, uh, is to discern what's going on and to realize that God is with us. That was John Wesley's famous last words, wasn't it? The great thing is, God is is with us and then secondly um, Truman says reflect long and hard on the church's core beliefs and practices and again picking up from Philippians stand firm chapter 1 verse uh, 27 I will know that you stand firm in one spirit contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened Uh, in any way by those who oppose you not being frightened we can be so intimidated by the culture around and by the hostility against Christianity that again is in the air we breathe but we are to reflect long and hard on our core beliefs and stand firm in them 
He mentions that again in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, with whom I love and long for, uh, my joy and crown, notice that joy again, uh, that this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Quote from Truman himself, Christianity, as both Martin Luther and John Henry Newman knew, is dogmatic, doctrinal, and assertive. Now, you wouldn't think that was the case from when you listen to most bishops and vicars, but this is New Testament, authentic Christianity. He reflects that worldviews, and incidentally, we've all got one, a worldview, hopefully yours is Christian, that he says that worldviews that capitulate on key doctrines collapse whilst those who resist social pressure and maintain their key beliefs thrive. I was, I'm a Winston Churchill fan, along with many people in this country, and uh, the film Darkest Hour, Churchill says there's this great temptation uh, to uh, make peace with Hitler. Um, and he says, countries that go down fighting tend to rise again. Those who tamely surrender tend to disappear. And it's the same of, uh, of the church and of Christians. We need to stand up, reflect long and hard on our core beliefs, and stand firm in them because they've been revealed to us in Scripture. And then thirdly, uh, Truman says the church must become a real community. The church faces a great challenge of authenticity, does it not? Given the many serious scandals over sexual abuse and their subsequent cover-ups, uh, stories of bullying and coercion by many high-profile vicars and pastors, so the culture already is set against us, suspicious, this idea that uh, Christianity is oppressive and so on, uh, particularly controlling and restrictive over gay marriage. Another problem is the many denominations and splits. You know, if you ever sat down and worked out how many denominations there are, going to Morecambe and looking at the churches there, going to be preaching at the church and the Nazarene, there's the Anglicans, and so it goes on, and splits within those splits. Um, interesting, Truman says this uh, to encourage us. He says, communities are in flux across the world, and he's thinking particularly of globalization here, um, and see the effects of it. Uh, look what happened to Liz Truss because of living in a global uh, community. He says the internet, whilst bringing many benefits, has undermined the concept of community. Take, for example, the absurd statement, online communities. How can you possibly be a community when you don't meet? Uh, a friend of mine at uh, the previous church worked for Opera Operation Mobilization, and um, uh, Peter Maiden, who was director then, uh, was encouraging them all to get a mentor and this, this uh, friend of mine has particular issues and problems, but uh, Peter was interested to chat to him later on and, and say, who's your mentor? Oh, such and such. How often do you meet? Oh, we meet once a month. Oh, that's great, said Peter. How do you meet? We meet online. Now, of course, uh, with Skype and so on, you can meet and see people and so on, but uh, you get my point. So Truman's uh, stress here is really, really important. A church must be a community, and a community that reaches out beyond itself. Um, I think a bishop who said the church was the only uh, community that exists for its non-members, so reaching out. He quotes the LGBT organizations, uh, not supporting their aims, but he says, look at them, how they have such strong community, how they care for one another and how they meet the needs of the people within uh, their community. The church must do that as well. And when Paul quotes uh, Isaiah 45 a second time, we haven't got time to turn to it, in Romans chapter 14, verse 11, he's using it to argue for community, that fellow members should not be judged on secondary matters. Instead, every effort should be made to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. And then he says, he warns that God will judge each Christian before his judgment seat. Again, that reference to the second coming. Philippians, uh, just connecting with Philippians 2, 
3 and 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So with sin clinging so closely, and the effects of the culture around us that affect us so deeply, how do we bow the knee to Jesus? Only by joyfully growing in Christian maturity. Every knee will bow, will certainly take place at the return of Christ. Western cultures rejected a transcendent God, taking up uh, Nietzsche, whose belief was that God is dead because we've killed him. Well, friends, we're meeting on Resurrection Day, Sunday, and God is very much alive and growing his church. But the church has a responsibility to be a light on a hill. Look at the wonderful impact that the Queen had, particularly through her low-key Christmas broadcasts. I'm working on a new book uh, title based on the words of Martin Luther. Uh, when he was thinking of the second coming of Christ and how to live faithfully in the present, Luther said, there are two dates in my diary, today and that day. I find that really helpful in the complex and busy lives that we live. Today, and think, I'm going to be thinking about the words of Jesus, enough are the troubles of today, uh, forget about tomorrow for the time being, and then the second thought, to think of that day when Christ returns. And then finally, uh, J.I. Packer, who I've mentioned already, in the foreword to a wonderful book I'm rereading called Worldly Saints, The Puritans as They Really Were, by Leyland Riken. And he argues we need the example of the Puritans because of their spiritual maturity, which is so lacking in the contemporary church. And I was struck by this thought, with which I'll end. I'll finish. The time has gone very quickly as it does. Uh, he says this. He defines Christian maturity in the foreword to this book as a compound of wisdom, goodwill, resilience, and creativity. I was fascinated by that. I'm trying to unpack it in my own mind. But as I finish this talk, as we think about bowing the knee, as we think of responding by bowing the knee to Jesus every day and to be growing in Christian maturity with joy in spite of our circumstances, what about those four things? Wisdom, goodwill, resilience, creativity. Wisdom to understand the sign of the times. Resilience to stick to our doctrinal beliefs no matter what. Goodwill and creativity to be an authentic, loving community to the glory of God. Let's bow our heads for a prayer.